Hello fellow gamers and welcome to a journey through the captivating landscapes of the Metal Gear Solid franchise. We have maps such as Shadow Moses, Afghanistan, all the way to the Big Shell. And all of these maps are not just backdrops, they are immersive worlds that etch themselves into the mind of the player, leaving that incredible mark of awe and wonder. Throughout the series, we've traversed through the intricate facilities, sprawling urban environments, each setting meticulously crafted to immerse players into the heart of the action. The attention to detail is staggering with every nook and cranny, holding secrets waiting to be uncovered. But what truly sets Metal Gear Solid apart is its ability to weave a narrative seamlessly into its environments. The landscapes aren't just there for sure, they are integral to the storytelling, serving as both playgrounds and stages for the unfolding drama. And then there was Metal Gear Solid 5 The Phantom Pain, a game that shattered the boundaries by embracing an open world design for the first time in the series. But why did it take so long for Metal Gear Solid to embrace this format? And was it actually necessary, considering all the love games previously did it so much better in my opinion? Well, we're going to get there, but I think it's only right that we start at the very beginning to understand why these maps were so loved to begin with. A lot of the classic Metal Gear games were linear, and they featured structured and predetermined progression paths that players must discover. Gameplay tended to be more focused with clear objectives or set levels for the mission. The Metal Gear Solid franchise really didn't hold back what it had to offer with its high levels of interactivity and such usage of the map, even if it wasn't considered as a big as an open world setting. Everything was nicely tightly packaged together, but it didn't feel too claustrophobic for us to feel like we could actually explore the game and all its secrets. While these classic Metal Gear Solid games introduced some elements of openness compared to its successor, The Phantom Pain with an open world setting, such as multiple routes through levels and optional objectives were still implemented within these classic games, that at the time would inspire many others to know that such linear games could have such compact detail, even in environments to make them seem more lived in and full of points of interest. Overall, Metal Gear Solid offers some degree of player's choice and freedom within its gameplay mechanics, but its narrative-driven structure and level design make it predominantly a linear gaming experience. You're all familiar with the Shadow Poses and Torture of the Seer's Administration. The brilliance of many Metal Gear Solid games feature the optional content such as side objectives, hidden items and alternative story paths. While these elements may add depth to the game and provide additional challenges, they are often separate from the main storyline and can be pursued at the player's discretion. All in all, the classics incorporate elements of player choice and exploration within their semi-open environments, offering a balance between linear narrative, progression and non-linear gameplay opportunities, as well as great pacing and level design. Hitman shares its similarities to Metal Gear Solid. Both games share this cool feature of a semi-open world environment that give you a ton of freedom in how you tackle your mission. In Hitman, it's like you're just dropped into these massive playgrounds filled with targets, and it's up to you on how you want to take them down. You can go in all stealthy, sneaking around corners, taking out guards without anyone noticing, or if you're feeling more, uh, well, explosive, you can use some serious chaos and slip away in the confusion. And just like Metal Gear Solid, Hitman makes you feel like the game is way bigger than it actually is. Each mission is packed with objectives and approaches, giving you this amazing impression that you're part of something much larger. The worlds of Hitman and Metal Gear Solid are very alike, where beauty intertwines with danger in captivating harmony. In Hitman's sleek sophistication meets strategic mastery as you navigate through stunning environments, from exotic streets to opulent mansions, Meanwhile, Metal Gear weaves a tale of stealth in espionage amidst diverse landscapes, from gritty compounds to untamed wilderness. Each location is a masterpiece of design, inviting exploration and delivering immersive experiences, even in semi-open world environments. Linear games offer a focused and curated experience that can be incredibly rewarding in their own right. 
While they may not provide the vast open worlds and endless exploration of their open world counterparts, linear games excel in delighting tightly crafted narratives, immersive environments, and engaging gameplay mechanics. One of the key strengths of linear games is their ability to maintain a sense of pacing and progression, with a predetermined path of the players to follow. Developers can carefully control the flow of the game, ensuring that every moment feels purposeful and impactful. This allows for a more tightly woven narratives, which where each event and encounter contributes to the overall story arc, leading to more immersive and emotionally resonant experiences. Additionally, linear games often feature highly detailed and visually stunning environments that are designed to enhance the storytelling and gameplay experience. While players may not have the freedom to explore these environments to the same extent as an open-world game, the level of interactivity and attention to detail can make them feel incredibly immersive and lifelike. From intricately designed set pieces to dynamic scripted events, linear games offer a level of polish and refinement that can truly be breathtaking. The linear nature of these games doesn't necessarily mean that they lack interactivity or player agency, on the contrary, many linear games incorporate interactive elements and branching paths that allow players to make meaningful choices and shape the outcome of the story. Whenever it's choosing between different dialogue options, exploring hidden pathways, or solving environmental puzzles, linear games often provide ample opportunities for the players to engage with the game's world and influence the direction of the narrative. In conclusion, while open-world games may offer expansive environments such as Metal Gear Solid V and endless exploration, linear games have their own unique strengths that make them equally compelling experiences, such as the old crafted Metal Gear Solid games that define the word of a great linear experience without taking away anything that's fundamental, from its gameplay mechanics to its wonderful story. Metal Gear Solid introduced innovative gameplay mechanics that have since become staples of the stealth action genre, from the iconic cardboard box, disguised to the tactical espionage gameplay, the series has consistently pushed the boundaries of what is possible in this interactive entertainment. Its emphasis on player choice and emergent gameplay has inspired countless imitators and continues to influence game design to this day. That in fact that it didn't even need to rely on open world environments to offer such a vast and interactive experience. But the essential part of this video is to try and explain really what was the better Metal Gear Solid game in terms of its maps and its pacing. Well that's why we're here today to discuss this very topic. Because throughout the Metal Gear Solid franchise there has been a diverse range of different environments that has made us feel different kind of ways in playing these games and how we interact and respond with the very said environment that no doubt have left a long lasting impression on all of us guys. But there can only really be one best map and I'm sure you'll all have your different opinions regarding on the experiences you've had with this amazingly wonderful franchise. But I think it's only right to discover the true origins of Metal Gear's map and its pacing and the brilliance of all what it had to offer for such a linear game is to go right back to its very humble beginnings on the MSX when the first Metal Gear Solid came to life. So as most of you know, the original Metal Gear game got released for the MSX platform in 1987 and it made an incredible mark on the gaming world, particularly with its innovative map design, structure and layout developed by Hideo Kojima himself. This pioneering title laid the foundation for the stealth action genre and introduced players to a level of strategic gameplay previously unseen before. One of the most impressive aspects of Metal Gear's map design was its non-linear layout with the confines of a 2D environment. Unlike many games of its time, Metal Gear offered players a sense of freedom and exploration with its maze-like military compound. The game's map was sprawling and labyrinth, filled with interconnected rooms, corridors and secret passages. Players were encouraged to explore every nook and cranny uncovering hidden items, weapons, and keycards essential for progression. In the original Metal Gear game for the MXS platform, the building layouts were a crucial aspect of the gameplay experience. The layout consisted of three buildings. With the beginning of the first section of the game, known as the first floor of the building, we can already see the complexities of already of what this map has to offer, considering it's not exactly an open-world game. We can see that throughout the entire map, 
well, there's different kinds of collectibles, key cards, different items we need along the way. Whether it be from the basement or the second or third floor of the first building, perhaps all the way to the third building, which all interconnects with the entire structure of the game. Hideo Kojima's brilliance of actually making this from just simply doodling and drawing different structures on a piece of paper is truly fascinating. It's even more fascinating when you come to realise that Metal Gear was actually the first one to evolutionise the likes of the stealth action genre, getting away from just a simple run and gun with simple map layouts. It was truly revolutionary and genius for its time. Hideo Kojima was displeased with the limitations of what the MXS had to offer, and with that, made the game to appear larger and bigger than it actually was, by through the condensity of what the game had to offer, in terms of finding keycards and progressing through different sections in the game, by keeping us invested with inside this map for such a long period of time, made it feel bigger than it really was. With such limitations on the MSX console, Hideo Kojima and team would naturally find a way to overcome the obstacles, because even with the very visual aesthetics of the game at the time, would always still find a way to somehow please the viewer and the audience with its own unique charm. It was never really a dull moment, even though the game itself isn't exactly highly appealing like modern day gaming with in terms of its visuals and gameplay controls. But one thing that it had to offer was the very uniqueness that it had to find such things as weapons and different tools and equipment you need along the way to get through. Such as needing scuba diving gear to get past certain different sections or using the gas mask in order to get through a room that is covered in gas. There was all different memorable and unique moments that make this beloved title that no doubt needs a remake come to life. Even the utilisation of using the remote controlled missile to get past the electrified floor. Simple things as if the player actually didn't get the remote controlled missile would find themselves having to explore the map further, making it appear larger than it is, hence my point. The most noticeable thing about Metal Gear is that first the player starts with the game unarmed, but eventually gains access to a variety of firearms, starting with the Beretta and explosives, working their way up to machine guns and guided rocket launchers, ammo and supplies for each weapon are limited but are easily replenished. Weapons can not only be used to kill enemies but also to clear obstacles such as the hollow walls or electrified floors. Snake can also use his fist to punch and defeat patrolling enemies and take any rations or ammo or any important items such as keycards that they leave behind. The cool thing is, is that the player uses the keycard and other items to unlock the doors or explore new areas. Doors will only open to their corresponding keycards, and bosses also appear throughout the game to interfere with the player's progress. I'm sure there is definitely someone out there that looks at the Metal Gear original games for the MSX as being the best map and level design that there is in the Metal Gear franchise, especially if you're willing to put the visual aesthetic aside. I mean, there's a lot to take from this game, and in fact would inspire the original Metal Gear Solid 1 on PlayStation 1 and games from then on. In a fact, this game is so innovative that a lot of its successes would go on to carry the torch of what made this game so brilliant to begin with, Metal Gear. The primordial soup and the evolution of what the Metal Gear Solid series would become to be. As a fan of Metal Gear Solid myself, we can all resonate together. There's moments within the franchise where quite naturally a lot of people will actually discuss some of the most iconic and locations and sections within the playthroughs of their experience whether it be the pacing of the level design and the certain sections within the level design that gets them so immersed within their game. Each different person having a different level section of the game that they are so enthralled by. I mean, the original Metal Gear game was no exception, but I've been able to use all different means and ways to enjoy the story throughout the journey that we undertake in order to uncover the truth. Really is truly impressive to what this series has to offer, as each different section of a Metal Gear game has people completely mesmerised in the sense of nostalgia of what this game brought them. What truly makes Metal Gear stand out from other Metal Gear games in the series is its high level of ambitious gameplay, as there's a high level of number of items we need to find in the game in order for the game's progression, a lot more than there is in any other Metal Gear game 
ahead of it. Let's be honest, I mean, there's disguises, there's mine detectors, there's antennas that you need, there's parachutes, there's an endless array of items that you need within this game in order for Snake to complete his mission. I mean, all you gotta do is go back and play this game, and when I say that it's probably the hardest Metal Gear games within the franchise, the one's been on the MSX, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, apart from those who are obviously masters at this game. No doubt guys, just like anything with Metal Gear Solid, a little bit of time and practice is all you need to become the master of this game. The brilliance of Metal Gear's background includes warehouses, control rooms, barracks, armories, prison cells, and even command centers. Overall, the diverse rooms within Outer Heaven contribute to the immersive and challenging gameplay experience of Metal Gear, providing players with a variety of environments to explore, enemies to encounter, and objectives to accomplish. Each room type presents in its own set of challenges and opportunities, requiring players to adapt their strategies and tactics according to succeed in their mission to infiltrate and destroy Metal Gear. As ridiculous as it may sound, even just something as simple as being chased after by really angry scorpions in the desert was quite a memorable moment for me. You didn't know if those things were going to poison your ass. Hey, no, no, bad scorpions, no. No, no, bad scorpions, no, get back. By far the best memorable moment for me with Metal Gear was definitely being locked up inside the jail cells after Snake had been caught deliberately by the enemy. Whilst he'd wake up inside the cell, most of all of the equipment that he had would no longer be there, so it'd make it so much more challenging as we also had a transmitter attached to us as well. Of course, Snake had to remove this transmitter in order to avoid enemy soldiers who will no doubt detect you if you keep this transmitter on you. Awesome thing about this section too, aside from going around the maze-like complex, is the very fact that we've got to find our great buddy Grey Fox as well to get some answers on what's really going on in Outer Heaven. So what that meant was busting through different sections of the wall by trying to punch the wall to test if it was brittle enough so we could actually explode it to get through to different sections in this maze-like prison. I swear when it comes to mission item objects to complete your mission, Metal Gear had the most selection of pieces of equipment that you need to get through. It was absolutely amazing. For me, one of the favourites of all time was also using the enemy uniform, so we could sneak our way in and out of building too. So I'm sure there's great many more memorable moments within Metal Gear that you will remember guys, and I'd love for you to fill the blanks within the comments section. The phrase that tends to get used a lot with Metal Gear is that this game is a way ahead of its time, which makes sense considering that how many people it still attracts a day to want to play this game and actually fall in love with what it has to offer. Metal Gear has over 10 bosses, and it's just truly impressive to think for a game at its time could have so much inclusivity with all what it has to offer with each different section within the facility, offering something exciting and fun. The pacing in itself could be quite difficult and challenging, unlike the other Metal Gear games which seemed a little bit easier, but once you'd overcome it, it was very rewarding and enjoyable. Overall, the building layouts in Metal Gear were an integral part of the game's immersive and challenging gameplay experience. Their intricate design, non-linear structure, and hidden secrets added depth and complexity to the game, setting it apart as a pioneering title in the stealth action genre. no way you could. It happened in Zanzibar six years ago. Only Snake and I know the real truth of what happened there. Released on July the 20th of 1990 for the MXS2 platform, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake marked a pivotal moment in gaming history. Developed by Hideo Kojima, the game is celebrated for its groundbreaking gameplay and mechanics, complex narrative, and technical achievements. This time round, it's been more improved since the last one. It serves as a direct sequel to the original Metal Gear, furthering and redefining the stealth action genre and solidifying Kojima's reputation as a visionary game designer. Interestingly, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake introduced several innovations that would become hallmarks of the series, including the iconic radar system and the much more improved on codex system. Metal Gear 2 would do it dramatically a lot better than the first game, that in fact, interactivity with the map would be all that much more better, because Solid Snake builds upon the stealth action-based gameplay system of its predecessor, 
As in the original Metal Gear, the player's objective is to infiltrate the enemy stronghold while avoiding detection from soldiers, cameras, infrared sensors, and other surveillance devices. The biggest change in this game was done to the enemy's abilities. Instead of remaining stationed in one screen like in the first game, enemy soldiers can now patrol different screens across a single map. Moreover, guards now have an expanded field of vision of 45 degrees, along with the ability to turn their heads, left or right, to see diagonally. The enemy can also detect sounds with the enemy able to hear noises made by the player, such as a punch to the wall and gunshots made without a suppressor, and will investigate the source of the sound once it is made. They can also detect sounds made from players walking on certain surfaces, which means players need to be more careful about the surfaces they walk on. If the player is discovered by the enemy, then a counter will be displayed on the upper right hand side of the screen that will go down after the enemy has lost track of the player, which no doubt is one of the most definitive staples within the Metal Gear Solid series that has redefined and changed the stealth genre for years to come. Noticeably as well, we're given a new variety of new manoeuvres and tools to help us remain undetected and complete the game. For example, the player can now kneel and crawl in addition to walking, allowing the player to avoid making noise over certain terrains, pick up landmines and hide in tight spaces such as under desks or inside air ducts, which makes exploration of the very map in Zanzibar much more of an enjoyable experience than its previous title. Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake is a sprawling and immersive environment that serves as the backdrop of the game's intense stealth action gameplay. The map of Zanzibar Land is rich with diverse locations, each offering unique challenges and opportunities for players to explore. Such as the areas in the jungle, where the land is characterised by its dense jungle and rugged terrain, which players must traverse through whilst avoiding enemy patrols and wildlife. The jungle areas offer opportunities for stealthy ambushes and environmental hazards, adding depth and complexity to the game's experience, including having to traverse through dangerous swamplands where you could sink at the bottom at any minute really do mark as memorable moments within the Metal Gear series, especially within this game. Even military complexes scattered throughout Zanzibar land are various military installations and complexes where players will encounter heavily armoured guards and advanced security systems. These locations often contain a lot of valuable resources and intelligence in them areas for players to gather. The brilliance of Metal Gear 2 is that it always has something to throw at you that's challenging. Instead of just a simple stealth infiltration mission, the environment around you always throws something challenging in your way. Beneath the surface of Zanzibar land lie a network of underground tunnels and secret passages, providing players with alternative routes and hidden pathways to explore. These tunnels offer opportunities for stealthy infiltration and evasion, and of course being covered in shit, since you're practically in the bowels of Zanzibar. Big Boss is a cool guy, but for those nuthuggers out there who think that he can't do no wrong, I mean, how do you explain child refugees locked in the sewer covered in shit? I'd love to hear an explanation for that one, but no doubt Zanzibar Land practically demonstrates Big Boss's descent into villainy. One of the most frustrating but yet memorable great parts about this game was having to follow the Green Beret to find Dr. Marv. What made the map design so cool and engaging was the Green Beret used to turn around to make sure that nobody was there, and with a funny sound effect that emphasises him turning around makes it hilarious. But in the pursuit of looking for Dr. Marv, we come across Dr. Madna, who uses a modified version of the tap code to communicate his radio frequency to Solid Snake from his prison cell which gives us the ability to be able to go on the codec and call him, which is a super memorable and impressive moment. Interestingly, the tap code was included into the original MSX2 manual for the Metal Gear Solid 2 Solid Snake. Its use in the game was an attempt of preventing video game piracy, since one must own the original game to have a copy of the manual. Of the two occurrences of tap code in Metal Gear 2, only Dr. Madnar's radio frequency is required for completing the game. The condensed English manual for the Metal Gear Solid 3 subsistence in which Metal Gear 2 was re-released provides Madnar's frequency but does not give the tap code table itself, nor the second frequency for Colonel Campbell. Konami instead posted the missing information in an FAQ page on their official website, a more comprehensive manual for subsistence which included the tap code table was later released with the Metal Gear Solid HD collection in digital form. And this also would include the Master Collection as well. By simply going onto the Konami website, you can actually get a good look at the manual yourself, the more updated one. 
A lot of Metal Gear fans may remember on PlayStation 1 with Metal Gear Solid 1, you could actually get Meryl's codec on the back of the case, which was absolutely revolutionary for his time, considering that nobody would have the slightest idea that Meryl's codec would have been on the back of the case. So one thing that massively goes overlooked, really, is that Metal Gear 2 on the MSX actually implemented this exact same thing on the MSX, only just making it a little bit more difficult by using Morse code and having to type in the code yourself by figuring out what each tap means. To put it short, decoding messages received through the tap code codec would appear on the screen as a series of taps, which players could decode by referencing the tap code chart provided in the game's manual or in game documentation through digital means. It's really quite memorable because it actually made the user go out of their way to look inside the manual back then in order to get through these sections that were important. Even finding one of the Zanzibar owls was one of the most memorable moments for me, just simply because of how cool it was that you could actually use animals within the environment to actually assist you on your sneaking mission. Just like Metal Gear Solid 3 when you could throw poisonous spiders or snakes at the enemies to aid you in your mission. And yes, the famous Bridge of Sorrows where Grey Fox blew it to shit and killed his former lover Gustava. We actually get to traverse the map by using a cool ass hand glider, which really just opens up to the level of expansiveness and cool ways we can navigate this very map. And some of you might remember the transport delivery system on the newer games, such as Metal Gear Solid 1 using different boxes to be transported in different areas of Shadow Moses, Metal Gear Solid 2 on the conveyor belts that would take you through to different locations, and including Metal Gear Solid 3 in and around Groznygrad getting in the transport truck with different cardboard boxes taking you to different locations. It's truly rememberable because it's a great way for us to navigate through the map. Sadly in Zanzibar there's no time for us to eat a nice pizza with Jacobson, but we do get some information that apparently inside Zanzibar Big Boss has some poison hamsters that just happen to be roaming Zanzibar one hitting everything in sight, including Snake. So in terms of map size, Metal Gear 2 Solid Snake generally had a larger and more expansive map compared to the original Metal Gear game. So the Zanzibar building was the main stronghold of a Zanzibar fortress. It was a four-story building that was constantly under 24-hour alert. Well, at least not here in this picture, because everybody's dead now. But with full support provided with various facilities, or house within it. The main entrance was to the south of the building, protected by a series of wired fences. And the main entrance was also locked on guard, presumably due to the entire fortress being on high alert because of sneaky boys trying to sneak in. In addition, the ventilation shafts also generated a jamming signal for the radar. And the very first floor housed the central command, the hangar and the factory. This was the central processing floor of the Zanzibar building, with important production and communication facilities concentrated in this area, roughly. The factory was on the west side of the floor where the Goliaths and Hind Ds and other large war machines were constructed. These vehicles were also maintained, refueled and repaired here demonstrating Big Boss's military fighting force in a more bird's eye view. So with the second and third floor, the second floor was the deck, which was used to watch over the first floor, and the two floors were not actually separated, but an elevator was required to move between them. The third floor was utilized as R&D purposes, and was used to store specialized equipment such as night vision goggles, mine detectors. Some of the areas of this floor were gas, so personnel was always equipped with gas masks. The fourth floor housed the living quarters for the soldiers, and as such, many allowances were provided to ease the wariness of their duties. One of the rooms was the mess hall. It was equipped with three sets of tables and stools, and two badass 40-inch TVs mounted on the wall for those who want to speedrun the Metal Gear games. Am I kind of breaking the fourth wall here? To the east of the mess hall was the freezer for storage of food supply, and cooling was possible down to the minimum temperature of a minus 100 degrees. Adjoining the mess hall on the southeast area of the floor were both men's and women's bathrooms. The gentlemen's was the sound blue colour, whilst the ladies' was a pail of pink. But anyway, since there was no female Zanzibar land guards, the woman's bathroom was used to house a secret elevator to the third floor basement. 
through which the confinement cell in the maze wood could be accessed. The bathrooms at night, however, scared several of the children at Zanzibar land, which just happened to roam around the entire facility. Believe it or not, but to the southwest of the floor was a hallway filled with an immense number of mannequins that resembled the Zanzibar land soldiers. According to sources, the bedrooms were located to the northeast of the floor, and 16 beds were provided in total, and the floor was made from wood for human comfort. Also, the locker room was to the east of the bedrooms, where the personnel could change their clothes before going to the sauna or to bed. Hilariously, sometimes the kids in Zanzibar loved to play hide-and-seek within the lockers, but with south of the bedrooms was the sauna used to ease the fatigue of soldiers. This was the only place where soldiers were allowed to remove their combat gear and practically chill out. But one can only imagine how fantastic this map and level design would be if this game could be more modernised and remastered in today's era. It truly does deserve it. Even considering back then how great it was, we can only imagine now by today's standards how amazing it would be. Because throughout the Metal Gear games like Peace Walker and Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, we get to see the outside perspective of what goes on within Mother Base. We never actually get to see what goes on with inside the building. And even if we do, we only get it to a limited extent. Unlike Metal Gear 2, where we can actually see everything that goes on with inside Big Boss's military nation. Really is like the perfect combination between outside and inside environments that really mixes up the diverse range of what makes this map so brilliant. But once again, it's just a simple case if people can get over the visual aesthetic. Because given on controls and graphics alike, there's some modern audiences that wouldn't appreciate the classicness of this game. Additionally, the map design compared to Metal Gear, this map was more complex and interconnected with multiple routes and hidden areas for players to discover, further enhancing the overall size and depth of the game's environment. With each section of every building was always floors and different rooms. It's undeniable to say how amazingly vast the map was on these old MXS games for their time. One that I couldn't encourage enough for some of you guys who've never played these games to give a try. Altogether within Zanzibar, there's about 11 epic bosses we get to fight within this game, which really all do play their part in this brilliance and the ambience of what Zanzibar land gives us. There's no doubt this game will go down as being one of the most innovative games of its time, but in fact had such a diverse open range of its map that unfortunately some of its successors couldn't outdo, but did really well in their own way. Well anyway guys, you let me know what you think of Metal Gear 2 on the MSX and your experiences with it, such as the level design, the pacing and the very map itself. I'd love to know, so leave it in the comment section just down below. There's no doubt that the Metal Gear games that would come after these games on the MSX were brilliant and fantastic within the more modernised platforms that offered the right perfect balance and pacing within the game without making it over strenuous, which some may argue that the MSX games did, but have no doubt earned their place within the gaming world of the Hall of Fame. The critics agree Metal Gear Solid is an absolute masterpiece. Games just don't look any better than this. The best reason yet to own a PlayStation. Metal Gear Solid by Konami. When Metal Gear Solid was released on the PlayStation in 1998, it was nothing short of a revolution in the gaming industry and everybody had to get a PlayStation 1. The impact it made was seismic, not just because of its gripping storyline and innovative gameplay mechanics, but also because it heralded a new era in video games graphics and immersion. The transition to 3D was a monumental leap for the Metal Gear franchise, allowing players to explore environments with unprecedented depth and detail. The game's visuals were a marvel at the time, pushing the boundaries of what was possible on the PlayStation hardware, from the intricately designed environments to the lifelike character models. Every aspect of Metal Gear Solid was meticulously crafted to immerse players into its world. The use of cinematic cutscenes and voice acting further elevated the experience. But perhaps the most groundbreaking aspect of Metal Gear Solid was its gameplay. It introduced players to a new level of stealth action gameplay, challenging them to think strategically and approach situations with caution rather than brute force. The game rewarded patience and ingenuity, allowing players to tackle objectives in multiple ways and experience different outcomes based on their decisions. Metal Gear Solid didn't just open up the 3D world for Metal Gear franchise, 
It set a new standard for storytelling and immersion within video games as a whole. Its influence can still be felt in modern gaming, with many titles citing it as a major inspiration. In short, Metal Gear Solid wasn't just a game, it was a landmark moment within gaming history. Anyone going with me? As usual, this is a one-man infiltration mission. Weapons and equipment OSP. Yes, this is a top secret black op. Don't expect any official support. Oh, looks like someone's been getting freaky. That's definitely an open invitation for infiltration. Learn from it. Regrets just make a person weaker. That's right. You belong on the ground. You should crawl on the ground like the snake you are. Snake, that is a nuclear warhead storage area. Are all these filled with nuclear warheads? A fight to the death with you. Only a back in my soul find respect. Before I die, you want to be by myself. I want to be left alone in my own world. Are you going to fight the whole world? <laughs> What's wrong with that? We can launch a nuclear warhead at any target on this planet. So the map of Shadow Moses is unlike any other map within Metal Gear's game series. Of course, it has the backdrop of Alaska. When people think of great map locations, Shadow Moses naturally becomes to the forefront of one's mind. We're dropped into an environment that is absurdly unknown. I mean, you can actually feel the temperatures within this map. It actually makes you feel cold yourself and you feel like you need to go grab a jacket. Considering this game was on PlayStation 1, the ambience and setting couldn't have been done any better to really depict exactly what Alaska would appear to be with its harsh and cold climates. The brilliance of this map is we get the impression that this is just the place where they dispose of nuclear weapons. It would actually be a secret front owned and operated by an arms tech dummy corporation for the development of Metal Gear Rex. What's cool about MGS1 is that the textures were also used creatively to create a more realistic and engaging environment. Rather than having a large number of unique textures, MGS creatively layered a small number of common textures to generate a unique look for a given surface. The use of polygons and textures was a solid foundation for Metal Gear Solid, but Konami took it one step further by having a dedicated optimization programmer that went through all the code to find crucial points of the engine to turn into an assembly code mostly to get models to fit nicely in the PS1 small 1KB fast cache. Whose footprints are these? Huh? What was that noise? Huh? Whose footprints are these? Huh? What was that noise? So on top of the already impressive game engine, the attention to detail considering the technical limitations is outstanding. You make footprints in the snow that will eventually get covered up by snowfall, you can identify guards and other characters by their breath in the cold air, water effects are accurate, lighting sourcing is dead on, and the textures are pretty solid. I mean, what's there really not to love? This game truly is absolutely mouthwateringly beautiful. Its map design and pacing is absolutely fantastic. Just as we can see, we start out here at the docks, at the very beginning of our mission, it already keeps us massively invested in what makes it truly memorable and what everybody can remember about the beginning of this game, it really was a great introduction to get us ready for what was to come. Especially just waiting for the elevator just made the moments all that much more intense, especially sneaking past the genome soldiers that carry the DNA of Big Boss, hence why they move around erratically at times, but was just a memorable moment because everybody was greeted with this very introduction at the beginning of this fantastic game. What about the air duct near the door? There should also be a duct on the second floor. The very beginning presentation opens up a whole new world. As we make our way up the elevator, we can actually see a great amount of detail as we have to try to figure out a way to infiltrate within sight this facility. But been doing so, there's only really two options. The vent from down below, and from which all you guys will remember, is guarded by a security camera and a genome soldier who is quite tired. 
or there's the very vent at the top of the stairs where a genome guard is just occasionally walking up and down, which is probably the most safer option. You let me know, guys, in the comment section which vent did you choose and why. If one thing is really truly memorable within Metal Gear Solid is the amount of surveillance cameras. But yeah, it appears that privacy is not a thing within Shadow Moses. Surveillance camera? But how can we forget about the notorious tank hangar? And if we all remember, there was an airlock door that seals itself and would release poison gas if we was careless enough to trip the infrared sensors, which I myself have done, and it is quite a terrifying but yet memorable moment for the reason why you need to take your time in that segment. This place had an elevator that would go down to two basement floors, although the second floor of the building was an observation balcony, and it contained two computer labs on the second floor, and one storage area on each floor. The second floor storage area was locked behind a large door and contained various crates and presumably acted as a pantry as it also contained various wine bottles and watermelons. The tank hangar also contained a diesel generator to produce electricity through the base. There was also as well a cargo elevator for travel between the hangar floor, the holding cells, the medical room and the armory to deliver supplies and to transport personnel. A canyon as well was just to the north, provided from a passage between the hangar and the said nuclear warhead storage building. And there's no doubt that we can all share the same kind of pain, having to wait for Merrill to unlock the cargo door for us for what only seems like forever. The cargo door is like an airlock. It's equipped with infrared sensors. Be careful. If an intruder is sensed, gas is released. Gas? Okay, so we'll meet at the nuclear warhead storage building. Wait, you said you'd stay put and be a good girl. Five hours later. The excellence of Metal Gear Solid 1 is just like many great classics back on the PlayStation 1, like Resident Evil, where most of the game takes place within inside the mansion. And given the card key system in Metal Gear Solid, makes the usage of having to backtrack a few times actually quite challenging, but fun at the same time. Because the pacing is quite rewarding, where with each section that you do advance to, when you do find yourself coming back, it's usually for a very good reason. Because the Snow Canyon itself has got to be a very unforgettable part of the map, with the Claymore Mines being laid absolutely everywhere all over the floor which really opens up the game for its exploration because most of you who are actually really smart probably wanted to try and find the mind detector unless you was a psychic and just knew where they was. So I'm not going to go into massive detail when it comes to the bosses within Metal Gear Solid. As some of you may recall that in some of the most memorable areas in the map, at some point you'd come across these iconic bosses that really all resonate in different segments of the map. That really does make it unique when you think of a particular boss and the background and the part of the map that really is truly memorable. So with the nuclear warhead storage building that reminds us of everything that's wrong with this world, it was the primary storage location of dismantled warheads. It has two basements and a first floor, and it could be accessed by a hangar door, and is primarily dug into the canyon, and it was also a stop for supply rooms, and had a noticeable garage door in the back that leads to the snowfield for trucks to traverse the glaciers separating it from the snowfield. This section here really highlights the needs for stealth infiltration, because anybody knows if you get spotted and you don't have a gas mask, you're in big trouble. Victims die within 15 minutes of the onset of symptoms such as nausea, perspiration, convulsions, headache or difficulty with breathing. You gotta be shitting me. So whilst many things do get put in categories and boxes, such as Metal Gear Solid being a linear game, I'd argue as well that Metal Gear Solid is definitely a non-linear game at times. Because usually in a linear game, there is only one path that the player must take through the level. Of course, Metal Gear does incorporate the fact that we can only go one way, because there's only one set direction on really how the story can unfold. I mean, there's not many options like in open world games, such as Oblivion or Skyrim, for example. And that's where my argument comes on about the game being non-linear at times, because players might have to revisit locations or choose from multiple paths to finish the level. As anyone knows who's played Metal Gear Solid 1, that the player can either leave Shadow Moses with either Meryl or Otacon. I mean, facts are that Shadow Moses really does have a good level of quality and design for its map that keeps players definitely enthralled. Whether it's going through the electrified floor that's covered in gas, or heading your way into the B2 computer room to fight Grey Fox, 
and even from there on, having to go back into the elevator to be one to face Psycho Mantis. When I say that Metal Gear Solid 1 has one of the best pacings in video games history of all time, you best believe it, it's that kind of game. It doesn't tend to really keep you waiting, and it's not necessarily long-winded to get to the next sections of the game, which are rather enjoyable and are usually very meaningful as well. There isn't a single area in Shadow Moses where you cannot remember a particular segment, because each location is just iconic as the location before. It definitely doesn't just get called one of the greatest games of all time for no reason, because arguably this was probably the best game that was out on PlayStation 1 at the time. There's no doubt there's something very mesmerising about the Shadow Moses map, something that keeps players coming back after all these years. Shadow Moses is a legendary map that isn't just a collection of pixels and polygons. It's a treasure trove of memories that have shaped the gaming landscape for decades. It's sprawling with corridors and hidden passages and filled with all different kinds of secrets with inside the facility. Every step we took as Solid Snake was laden with anticipation and, of course, excitement as we uncovered the mysteries lurking around every corner. The level structure in Metal Gear Solid 1 is really well drawn out. There was a particular segment in the game where you had to make sure the PAL cards that you had were cool or warmed, hence going back to where you fought Raven, or going to the very furnace room to change the very temperature accordingly to what the key cards require in order for you to place them inside the terminal. What truly makes Shadow Moses unforgettable are the moments of quiet introspection, as we explored the desolate landscapes and pondered the implications of our actions. It's here, amidst the crumbling ruins and the icy winds, that we forged a bond with Solid Snake and embarked on a journey that would stay with us long after the credits rolled. But I'm sure that many of you viewers have had many great experiences with, and for that I'd love to know once again in the comment sections what really resonated with you the most in Shadow Moses? After all, some places are more than just pixels on a screen. They're a part of who we are. And how can we forget about some of the great secrets, such as being inside the prison cell and not escaping and eventually Grey Fox busting you out? Ninja. And by the time you've actually busted out the cell, one doesn't actually need to kill Johnny and create a time paradox. You can just simply let the diarrhea do its thing whilst he runs to the toilet with that hot mess dribbling down his leg. Excuse me. Released in 2001, Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty emerged as a groundbreaking addition to the gaming world. Set against the backdrop of the Hudson River, the game's opening chapter, Abroad the Tanker, serves as a testament to the brilliance of its design and even more so when you're playing the updated GOG version on 4K. You can really see the map come to life as we see New York not too far from a tanker in the middle of the ocean, with raging storms and weathers that really make this feel like an intense sneaking mission. Most people who've experienced Metal Gear Solid 2 are enveloped in an atmosphere of tension and intrigue, and the absolute mystique of the ambience that this game brings, such as the waves hitting the tanker, the rain hitting the steel. What makes a map really truly immersive is when everything combined together, especially with audio effects, really makes the feel of playing within the tanker very realistic. Even hearing such things as Snake's footsteps and the rain splashing against his sneaking boots. Venturing inside, players navigate a labyrinth of narrow corridors and interconnected rooms with each its own purpose and unique design. From crew quarters to engine rooms, every area of the tanker feels meticulously crafted, with attention to detail evident in the placement of objects and environmental storytelling. <laughs> Even simple things like easter eggs that have no relevance to the main storyline structure of Metal Gear Solid 2 are necessarily really what makes this map super enjoyable and fun to play. Little elements that are 
tied together that keep us remembering specific moment within MGS2, especially the tanker, that really does keep us coming back for more. Something as simple as shooting the pipes and just the all-round atmospheric effects of the sound effects and everything else with the visual design is truly what brings this map to life, even if the structure itself isn't the largest Metal Gear Solid map we've seen, but with the video and audio dynamics and the very physics themselves, is truly what makes Metal Gear Solid 2's tanker very amazing and enjoyable to play. The brilliance of the physics engine is vividly showcased aboard the tanker, elevating the immersion and realism of the gaming experience to new heights. One of the most striking examples of this attention to details lies in the interaction with the environment, where even the smallest actions yield tangible consequences, and just simple things that can quite clearly go unnoticed. Like shooting the cup that is full of ice and actually seeing over time the ice slowly dissipate and melt. So this attention to detail may seem minor to some, but in the grand scheme of the gameplay, it's these subtle nuances that breathe life into the world of the tanker. It's about creating that sense of immersion that transcends mere pixels on a screen, drawing players into a living, breathing environment that kind of feels as though as if it exists independent of their actions. And in experiencing these moments, for old school players and newcomers alike, we are reminded really why this game is truly way ahead of its time and it really does put modern day gaming to shame because whilst this game is an open world it does feel very lived in whether it be inside the tanker or even outside overlooking at the new york harbor and with the level of the torrential storm really makes the player feel the actual weather effect it was at this moment that he knew he fucked up so usually when one makes their way further into the belly of the tanker, things do become dramatically more interesting. I mean, at first Snake thinks he believes he sees Raven, which is quite terrifying enough, but it turns out to be this cool little toy shooting these plastic balls all over the floor, which no doubt most players who played this game have probably gone out of their way to shoot this thing. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm an avid collector of Metal Gear Solid figures, and I'd like that in the collection. And definitely not a dead body falling out of my wardrobe mysteriously. As you progress through the lower levels of the tanker, you can't help but feel a sense of anticipation building, like what secrets lie hidden within the darkness, what dangers lurk around the next corner. Metal Gear Solid 2 offers some really creative ways to get around the map, including using hanging as well, which can be quite risky but rewarding at the same time. I mean, what's not to love really about the actual tanker map? In fact, a few people in the MGS community said they'd actually preferred it if the game was actually based wholly in the tanker. Everything around us just seemed very interactable, even something just as simple as a goofy poster on a locker. But even from the intense moments that we have to face, such as shooting the Semtex to get further into the hold, which makes making finding the Metal Gear prototype really interesting. But by far one of the most memorable moments for me on the map has to be the guy on the loudspeaker. Arizona Bridge checkpoint passed. All non-essential personnel report to the holds in 10 minutes time for the scheduled briefing session with the Commandant. You are ordered to continue manning your posts until that time. I think what makes the tanker sequence a lot more enjoyable than the plant chapter is the very fact that, whilst it may not be as big, there's a lot going on that really keeps us invested in a stealth infiltration mission unlike any other where the ship itself is constantly moving to its destination, which makes us feel like the very time schedule that we're appointed is very limited. Further we dig deeper into the tanker, just unravels the very conspiracies and the shadowy organisations and the dealings behind such events. Even though there's a race against the clock, we can't help ourselves to feel so enthralled and intrigued by what the tanker map has to offer. You can find yourself in problematic situations just messing around, as I was trying to distract the guards, I pressed the projector button far too much, and the screen ended up projecting what I believe to be Hideo Kojima's holes because, well, he's the biggest pimp on the planet, or perhaps just some ex-girlfriends that he once knew. Either way, I'm sure Hideo Kojima has major risk, 
But from here on out, I was screwed, and I'm sure many of you was when you first did this, because I couldn't actually get off the projector, and by the time it had switched off, the guards lost their shit. So I think, to be honest, it really goes without saying that the most memorable section within the tanker has to be when we finally reach where Metal Gear Solid Rear is being held. Of course, from there, then, we have to take pictures and try and get them over to Otacon to expose this prototype to the world. But no doubt, being the photographer that Solid Snake is, We've taken a few pictures along the way, which had the best hilarious dialogue when we actually uploaded them photographs, which made the tanker incident one of the most unforgettable and funniest maps that I'm very sure that most of us can agree on. This isn't a photo of Metal Gear anyway. Sorry, but you're gonna have to go back and shoot another set. The Big Shell was a large marine decontamination facility established approximately 30 kilometers offshore from Manhattan, New York. The facility was comprised of two hexagon structures, Shell 1 and Shell 2, connected end on end north to south and each structure consisted of a central core surrounded by six struts. But the Big Shell has got a wider conspiracy when you look into the broad aspect of what it has. In reality, the Big Shell's construction had merely been a cover story to disguise the development of Arsenal gear. The design of the Big Shell is as deceptive as it is impressive. Its hexagonal platforms interlock seamlessly, forming a labyrinth structure that spans the expanse of the facility. Each section is meticulously crafted from the towering struts that support the upper levels to the sprawling interiors that house a multitude of secrets. Players who've navigated the interconnected hexagons of the Big Shell, they are treated to this visual spectacle unlike anything else in gaming. The shimmering waters of the ocean stretch out in all directions, whilst the metallic sheen of the facility gleams in the sunlight. It's a stark contrast to the dark industrial corridors of the tanker, serving as a testament to the game's ability to evoke a wide range of emotions and atmospheres. But what makes Metal Gear Solid's maps truly impressive and immersive is when you understand the development behind such evolution of these very maps. With Hideo Kojima himself, being a designer of a lot of these structures, and being the technical genius he is, would use such things as Lego in order to plan the layout and the level design of such maps. The very first beginning part of Metal Gear Solid 2 is a spectacle as we meet Peter Stillman, the OG of, of Bomb Disposal, and an absolute peg-leg genius. The Bomb Disposal sequence will always go notice for its iconic level, and nice pacing from going from different shells, trying to locate where the bombs are being placed. The level sequence itself had a very great level of intensity, as well as encouraging the player to explore around the big shell itself. Where some people may have found this tedious and boring, others within different contrasts loved it very much, and really felt like the level design within the map fit just perfectly. You spray this on the sucker and there we go. Simple, huh? What the hell happened? Right. Oh boy, let me tell you about the bombs in the big shell in Metal Gear Solid 2. They were like a game of hide and seek, but with explosives. You'd be tiptoeing around, trying to look em all cool and stealthy, and then BAM! You stumble across one upon them stealthy little bombs. It was like some twisted scavenger hunt, but instead of finding candy or treasure, you're trying to defuse these ticking time bombs before they blow the whole place to smithereens. You knew there was a bomb practically in each different shell, and when you found one, it was like having to use your ridey senses to get a good idea of where they could be. And being armed with cutting-edge technology like the coolant spray, you'd simply just spray that sucker out and it defused the bomb. It's weird to say that we enjoyed defusing bombs. It is like an easter egg hunt, but the difference is you've got to defuse these bombs. 
We could only imagine how much of a terrible parent Fat Man would be if he had his own children. Of course, depending on what difficulty you played this game on, some bombs will be placed in different locations, but it's fair to say that this is definitely what made going around the big shell and Metal Gear Solid 2's map really interesting. At least at the very first segment. It's time to start the party. This is how it works. I plant a bomb and it'll explode soon after that. You're fucking insane. So just when you thought you was a bomb disposal specialist, you trigger off the big bomb, which is now giving you a timer, which I would say with plenty of time. Personally, I think they should have met the timer a little bit more less time because it would have made it more intense to try and find this bomb. I mean, if you know where you're going and you actually pay attention, you can find this bomb fairly easy. And if you're a newcomer and you haven't found the bomb in particular, then well done to you because you've just created what they call a time paradox where practically half of the most important characters in the game will be dead. Well, which was sadly the case for poor Peter Stillman, who will no doubt rest in peace. Let's spill some liquor for this OG. Okay, this is a C4 sucker. Now you spray this on the sucker. Spray three to the detonator. Cock. So once Raiden absolutely bodies Fat Man, then it's a question of trying to find the last bomb. For us who played the game for the first time, might not really knew where the bomb was. I mean, the sensor told us that the bomb was right there. First time playing, I didn't think it was possible lifting this fat ass out the way. I mean, the guy weighs 300 pounds. So you're on a top secret mission to rescue Ames, right? But here's the kicker, you're incognito. So by using the enemy disguise, sneaking around like a boss, trying to be all stealthy and serious, let's be real here. When you're disguised as one of the bad guys in this segment, it's hard not to have a little fun with it. Sure, you're supposed to be on a mission and professional, but where's the fun in being super serious all the time? Sometimes you just gotta let loose and have a little fun, even if it means getting into a bit of trouble along the way. Pacing's great because it's straightforward. You just go down to B2, get the directional microphone, which you get constantly reminded how to use it, ask the fucking para who you assume must be Ames, or at least tell you directions to find Ames. What do we have here? Right. One of those hostages in there is Ames. <laughs> Seriously? Come on, this section is as memorable as it gets when you're looking out for Ames and the hostages. Who didn't mess around several times and get themselves killed because the guard spotted you beating up the hostages and acting highly suspicious? And there was always that one baldy fudge packer who would constantly trip you over if you went past him. Cheers, dude. Shut the fuck up, you cunt! So well done to you, give yourself a round of applause, because if you've made it to this bit here, then you probably realise how much of a fun the section this was using the sniper rifle. Of course, we need to disable the Semtex, and in doing so means destroying the control panels. And it also means getting a little bit wavy and faded on benzodiazepine, unless you want to wave all over the place and just blow the entire facility up, because you're stupid. Right, do you actually enjoy abusing helpless animals? Yes. I don't believe this. I had no idea you were that kind of a monster. You got that right, I'm a freak in the sheets. <laughs> they got my eye! So after you take out Soldus and he loses his eye, he smashes and crashes straight into this strut, which messes the entire base up. But we're left with a cool parkour sequence that is very memorable and even better with this camera mod. Honestly, I really wanted a lot more of this segment, but unfortunately it came to an end when I slipped on bird shit. So now do you understand why I like to kill seagulls? Rose, you annoying bitch. <laughs> if you didn't enjoy this segment, you'd be lying to yourself. It was a fun part of the game. I mean, Raiden's a gymnastic specialist. He actually makes young girls who go to gymnast school look like amateurs. So I've heard people on Reddit who cry and whine why they don't like the plan chapter, and to be honest we I really don't see it. Whilst yes, it's not my map that I would particularly choose out the rest, it's still fun and it has memorable moments. It isn't like some open world games where they're just stiff and every time you go out of that particular environment it's always the same. It seems to be ever changing in Metal Gear Solid 2.
and it's as memorable as it gets on Metal Gear Solid 2 when Raiden receives his first golden shower, which I'm sure some of you guys probably did this and didn't try to avoid it, because you're probably into some freaky shit. Oh yeah, there is. Well, I've got an idea, kid. Why don't you use the Nikita missile, just like in Metal Gear Solid 1? It's going to be the only way to blow up the electrical panel, but I'd rather blow up the president, because he pretty much tries to jerk you off as soon as you see him. What are you On his balls. I've got balls of steel. Hmm. What the? You're a man? Correcting other people when they misgender others, like... Shut the fuck up. Shut the fuck up. And it's the unforgettable shell too that is absolutely flooded in this underwater rescue mission to get Emma out of this shithole. But to be honest with you guys, what makes this even more intriguing is to think that originally Hideo Kojima intended to have sharks within this segment. Yes, it seems a little over the top, I get that, but in this wide world of ours, what isn't actually crazy and doesn't make sense, and especially Metal Gear. It's a fun segment to remember within the map. It's bringing us something different other than just actually walking around the big shell. I mean, the cool thing about Emma is yes, she can't barely walk, but at least she's not as annoying as Ashley, who constantly gets kidnapped and always screams. I feel like we wouldn't be doing the Metal Gear Solid 2 map justice if we didn't actually take a look at the beautiful imagery within this scene within Twilight Sniping. With a beautiful sunset that waves goodbye to the world with echoing shades of purple and orange sky. A beautiful but yet tragic theme regarding the likes of Emma Emmerich. I mean, this section in itself was truly rememberable. Some people hated it, some people loved it. You'd take out Claymore Mines and basically just clear an overall path for Emma to make her way. And if you sucked, you'd call Pliskin, who'd give you assistance along the way. So we make it to one of the coolest segments within the game, if not the best. Arsenal Gear, the new Outer Heaven. Where Raiden has been stripped completely naked and no doubt needs to go to the gym and hit the bench press. With Raiden being in this vulnerable state, you cannot deny that you probably did the same thing. You wanted to see if Raiden was packing the very essentials of what it is to be a human being. With so much attention to detail in this game, it's hard not to try and discover these things. Help you! What the fuck? So I'm with the opinion that really we should have had more playtime within Arsenal gear. There was something mystique and ominous about the very atmosphere within this place. It almost felt like we was abducted and taken onto an alien craft. This segment becomes one of the most memorable bits within the Metal Gear Solid 2 map simply because of the codec calls with the batshit insane Colonel Campbell, who turns out to be an AI giving us immense schizophrenia. I hear it's amazing when the famous purple stuffed worm in flat jaw space with the tuning fork does a raw blink on Harry Carey Rock. I need scissors. 60. What kind of drugs have you been smoking? The further we actually got inside Arsenal gear, the map really isn't much really to talk about, but it's the segments that are so memorable, such as helping Snake fight the Tengu which was arguably probably one of the best moments within the game because you get to finally have a little bit of co-action with the legendary Snake. Raiden kind of feels like an extension of ourselves being the player and fighting alongside Solid Snake is truly an honour. Whilst there isn't really much going on in this map, it serves as the perfect battleground for you to kick some ass. But sadly, the biggest plot twist in the game ends because Solid Snake is actually the enemy and decides to kill Raiden, the main protagonist. Damn kid. <laughs> This is Snake. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the Voice Box's channel. <sighs> Federal Hall. <laughs> and yes, you even get to go to Federal Hall, one of America's finest landmarks. So in the end, the big shell stands as a testament to the power of deception and illusion, both within the world of the game and in the minds of its players. Its intricate design and clever disguise serve as a fitting backdrop for the epic tale of espionage and intrigue that unfolds within its walls, leaving a lasting impression on all those who dare to explore its depths. But you're 
So let's dive into the legend that is Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater. You know, this game wasn't just made, it was crafted with love and attention to detail that is hard to find anywhere else. Hideo Kojima, the mastermind behind the Metal Gear series, decided to take us back in time with Snake Eater. Instead of the futuristic setting of the previous games, he dropped us smack dab in the middle of the Cold War, and it's like being transported to a whole new world, filled with espionage, intrigue, and some seriously epic boss battles. And we should talk about the map, because oh boy it's a thing of beauty, and it's like Kojima took a paintbrush and created this lush diverse landscape that just begs to be explored. From dense jungles, teeming with wildlife to snowy mountains, shrouded in mystery, every inch of the map is bursting with life and detail. But what really sets Snake Eater apart is its storytelling. I mean we're talking about a game that tackles themes like loyalty and betrayal, and the nature of warfare with the finesse of a seasoned novelist. And don't even get me started on the characters. They're so well developed, you'd swear they were real people. And let's not forget about the gameplay, and Snakey introduced a whole bunch of new mechanics like the camouflage and the hunting for food that added a whole new layer of depth to the experience. It's like Kojima took everything we loved about the previous games and cranked it up to 11. Now I know what you're thinking, greatest game of all time that's a bold claim but trust me once you've experienced the magic of snake eater for yourself you'll understand why so many fans consider it a masterpiece The lush wilderness of Salino Yask in Metal Gear Solid 3. Now that is definitely an adventure you'll never forget. You're dropped into this fictional slice of Russia, a sprawling landscape of dense forests, rugged mountains and winding rivers. It's like something straight out of a storybook, but with the healthy dose of Cold War intrigue thrown in for good measure. Now one of the things that makes Snake Eater stand out is its pacing. Unlike some of the previous games in the series, there's not a whole lot of backtracking here. Instead, you're constantly moving forward, exploring new areas and facing new challenges at every turn. It's like the game knows exactly when to throw something new your way, keeping you on your toes without ever feeling overwhelmed. As speaking of challenges, let's talk about Naked Snake's journey through Selino Yask. As you progress through the game, you can't help notice how much he grows and evolves along the way. From a rookie agent to a seasoned soldier, every step forward is a testament to his strength and determination in the face of adversity. And for the player, a pure sign of progression. And with each unwinding narrative of what this map will unfold, we get to discover its brilliance. Throughout the evolution of Metal Gear Solid, things have naturally become all the more improved and a lot better. We can see the physics and the dynamics of when we cut the ropes on this bridge. It's a pivotal point within the map because it's also where Snake gets his ass thrown off and presumably should have been dead but was more than alive, which adds to the immense level of his character building throughout Metal Gear Solid 3. The story progression is really charming, there isn't really much backtracking to do as I've mentioned. The game has a very forward and direct story progression. There is really one time that you do have to backtrack because during the virtuous mission which turns out to be a disaster, you end up coming back during Operation Snake Eater, but from then on is where your journey really begins. Goodbye. 
And how can we forget about the memorable Raz Vet, which was recently showcased within the Metal Gear Solid 3 Delta remake? It's got memorable moments such as rescuing Sokolov and fighting the Ocelot unit, and just the overall rustiness of the place really does make you feel like this is some old rundown base that really encaptures some great moments, including getting to look at Eva's boobies. The name's Eva. Ugh, oh, Snake, you definitely want to smash. Hideo Kojima, the very lead director of this masterpiece of a game, Metal Gear Solid 3, had some very interesting things in regards to say about the development of Metal Gear Solid 3, and how really this all coincides with the immersion of this very map. Hideo Kojima said, and I quote, I decided that MGS3 should be about survival, and I started thinking about how survival would work in the game. The game takes place in the 60s, and if the game was going to be about survival, I decided it better had to take place in the jungle, he said, end quote. MGS previously had heavy reliance on tight indoor environments, which meant a lot of proof concept testing was required, including experiments to see if the team could create MGS in real-time outdoor environment. Kojima was quoted saying, and I quote, What we did was create the experimental environment was that we went to islands like Yakushima, Aomiya Oshima, and even places in Canada, he told GameSpy. He also says that these places are full of a lot of vegetation, like Japanese jungles. Based on our research, we created the fictional jungle forest to see if it worked. End quote. From here, Kojima's team had to work out how the game would work within the jungle, so they called in MGS2 military advisor, Moto Seda, Mori, and asked him to show them how they would survive in the wild. Kojima and team realised they had to junk the previous graphic engine. To quote Kojima, it was just too slow. Which gave Kojima an opportunity to work on the actual script. To quote Kojima again, I worked on this thing called the script, meant basically the game from the beginning to end, with notes about what happens throughout the game, what happens to the character, and whenever there are sounds that he makes or sounds in the environment, end quote. That resulting document dropped the development from there. But why it is so substantial to Metal Gear Solid 3's map is because the environment is very much so immersive, and it's the very fact that the interactivity is non-stop with the entire map. It's not just particularly segmented areas like the previous games before, this game is fully immersed with having to interact with the map at all costs. For example, at this particular point in the river, it is full of leeches, and you have to utilise the survival menu, otherwise you'll lose your stamina. Metal Gear Solid 3 is a testimony to true survival in a video game. I mean, the very fact that you have to avoid crocodiles and poisonous creatures, the interactivity with the environment is literally interlinked with the character. It is a projection, it is a close connection between the two. The very map and the environment encourages the viewer to actually interact with it because it's a necessity. Instead of really just ploughing your way through the game, every move that you make in different segmented areas are very important to your survival. And also, we cannot forget to mention the very fact that Metal Gear Solid 3 introduced the Camo Index system for the first time ever, where the player really had to rely on the map itself in order to take cover for stealth infiltration, which is truly genius, and probably arguably makes it the best Metal Gear for how well structured and the level design of the game actually is. The maps are actually quite plentiful with different routes and different directions you can take. It's plentiful and it's full of items that you can use to assist you along your way in your mission, such as the Croc Cat. Exploration in Metal Gear Solid 3 isn't tedious, it's fun, it's challenging, and in fact, it's even rewarding when you come across a special item. Metal Gear Solid 3 also added the function to be able to climb trees, which makes being in the jungle all that much more engaging. This very segment here, surrounded by the barbed wire fences, it's just another particular point within the game that makes it very unique and memorable because not everything is the same. There's always something new that comes to challenge the player. There's even like military checkpoint bases as well that are surrounded by heavily fortified structures and machine guns that really keep an eye on you in case enemies try to infiltrate this base. It's brilliant because it's a great way to restock on your ammunition, your items, your supplies as such. 
I mean, heck, sometimes even Snake gets sick of eating wildlife and might fancy something a little bit more tasty like a calorie mate. Or maybe just blowing up helicopters for the fun of it. Oh yeah, that's my kind of fun. So let's chat about those eerie cave systems in Metal Gear Solid 3. They're like something straight out of a suspense thriller. You're deep in the heart of Selino Yask, navigating through these dimly lit tunnels that seem to stretch on forever. The air is thick with the sound of dripping water and the occasional scuttle of a snake or frog, or even crabs. It's enough to send shivers down your spine. Let's talk about the level of immersion, because these caves have it in spades. As you wander deep into the darkness, you can practically feel the chill of the damp air against your skin. The sound design is on point too. You can hear the wind whistling through the crackles and the rocks, and the echo of your footsteps bouncing off the walls is enough to make you feel like you're right there in the thick of it. These caves are exactly empty. Oh no, they're home to all sorts of creepy crawlies that can poison you and everything in between, and let me tell you, stumbling upon one of these critters in the dark is enough to make even the bravest of souls jump out their skin. Imagine just for a moment, guys, that you lost your torch. Yeah, I know, not exactly ideal, right? And suddenly these caves go from mildly unsettling to downright terrifying. You're stumbling around in the darkness, relying solely on your instincts to guide you. Every little noise sets your heart racing, and every shadow seems to conceal some unseen danger. Of course, when you find the torch, it's truly a sight of relief. But hey, that's all part of the thrill, right? It's that sense of fear and uncertainty that makes exploring these caves so exhilarating. And dare I say, I wish I had more of. So once you'd make it out of the cave system, you'd come across this very unique segment in this little river, surrounded by guards on these hovercrafts. But like I said, interacting with the environment to collect certain items is truly beneficial, such as the croc cap, which allows you to swim directly underneath the spotlights to get past without even having to get out of the water and maybe try and figure out another way around. What I love about Metal Gear Solid 3 is the fact that when you use particular items, it really connects with the environment, other than just the actual in-game objects in the game, such as lasers or sensors, for example. There's plenty of wonderful items that assist us on our mission in Metal Gear Solid, but really none quite like the Croc Cap, which is highly unique, and it serves its purpose very well, just like the very cardboard box that I like to use quite often. It's time to go for a little swim. In Granin's lab, or even outside the lab, it's like stepping straight into a scene out of a spy movie. You're standing outside the lab and he's surrounded by an electrified fence and a couple of not-so-friendly guard dogs patrolling the perimeter. But despite the danger, there's something undeniably beautiful about Metal Gear for Solid 3's ambience with the night and the moon casts a soft glow over the landscape and you can hear gentle rustles of leaves in the breeze and along with the distant chirping of the crickets and the occasional hoot of an owl. Now here's where things really get interesting because there are two ways to get inside this facility and there couldn't be more different. Option one, you crawl through a vent, sneaky as can be, like a true spy on a mission, but then there's option two and trust me, it's a doozy you can just walk right up to the front door and knock like you're stopping by for a friendly visit. It's equal parts hilariously and ballsy, and it's the kind of move that only someone as bold as Naked Snake could pull off. And let me tell you, sneaking past that guard whilst he's distracted is like a rush like no other. You can practically feel the adrenaline pumping through your veins as you slink past him, blatantly taking the piss. When stepping in Granin's lab in Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater, it's like stepping back in time to the swinging 60s in Russia. While you're strolling down the halls of this cool retro facility and everywhere you look, it's like you've been transported to a different era. The Russian 60s style interior is on full display, from the sleek minimalist furniture that screams vintage, 
But despite the groovy decor, there's an unmistakable tension in the air that hangs, heavy like a thick of fog. The halls echo with silence, broken only by the occasional clank of boots against the floor. It's like the whole place is holding its breath, waiting for someone or something to disturb the quiet. Now, here's where things really get interesting, because you've got a couple of options for how you want to proceed. You can either dress up as a scientist, blending in with a crowd and trying to fly under the radar, or if you're feeling particularly daring, you can go in guns blazing, no disguise, no mercy, fully naked, and just pure adulterated infiltration. But no matter how much the approaches we choose, one thing for sure, Granny's lab feels like a well-lived-in facility, with specialised guards and scientists going around their business. That sense of purpose in the air, like everyone has a job to do, and they're damn well going to do it. And hey, if you're feeling that extra sneaky like we all do, you might even catch a glimpse of Granny himself, or at least his shoes anyway. It's the little details like the little tiny moments of humanity in the midst of chaos. Really, out of anything else, makes seeing Granny's shoes the best thing to do in this game. And including why Metal Gears should wear pairs of shoes too, it's revolutionary, right? Look at these. Nice shoes. The Forest of Salino Yask only grows larger and more intense when you head your way to face the end. It seems that the jungle becomes a lot more dense and a lot more vibrant and really opens up the expansiveness of the very forest itself. Because the beginning sections of Metal Gear Solid 3, they're quite tightly closed together, whereas in this section here it really opens up the expansiveness of the actual forest itself, leading to different directions that actually lead to some cool areas. Most of this game actually takes place within these woodland environments, with tall grass that you can use to ambush the enemy with, and different kinds of trees where you can see different moss and trap placements set around the actual environment that stalls you from getting to your next section. But I think by far one of the most interesting moments within this segment is actually going to see the cabin that is actually in the woods, which is sort of like an armory slash place where soldiers stare at their guard post. Some people can easily avoid this point without even knowing. When I first played this game, I had no idea this was even here. And then when I found it, I realised how cool this place is. And a part of me actually wanted to stay here for a little while and actually chill out, because the idea of a cabin in the woods is actually really relaxing. You can see different beds here where obviously the guards are stationed here whilst being on their patrols and no doubt eat their food here and practically live in it like a house. It's actually quite a shame that Snake couldn't have enjoyed a vacation here, chilling out on the roof, catching a tan, while smoking his cigars and maybe having a few beers, taking in the breathtaking beauty of what these woodlands have to offer. Socro Veno Forest is like stepping into a fairy tale, but with a twist of danger lurking around every corner. You're surrounded by towering trees, branches reaching up to the sky like fingers grasping to the heavens. The forest is alive with the sound of birds chirping, water trickling, and leaves rustling in the breeze. It's like the whole place has a heartbeat of its own, pulsing with life and energy. But here's where things get interesting. There's something about Sokoveno Forest that feels watchful. It's like the trees are whispering secrets to each other, and the animals are keeping a close eye on your every move. It's enough to send shivers down your spine, but in a strange, exhilarating way. And of course, it's one of the most iconic things within gaming ever. The ladder climb. The one thing that's considered the ultimate boss battle on Metal Gear Solid 3. If you can climb this ladder, it's a real true test of endurance. But not just that, it's a moment of retrospection, a moment of insight and self-reflection of oneself. This here is the most memorable moment within Metal Gear Solid 3. There isn't a person who would not remember this moment. Damn, I forgot my cigars. I'm gonna have to climb all the way back down.
And being high within the altitude on these icy mountain tops, which at the very bottom below we can see from the distance we've traveled, really showing the scale and the quality of this map. Because in reality, this map isn't really all that big, but the illusionary way that it's designed makes it feel so vast and large. It's truly a sight to behold, especially when you can see Grosnygrad from the mountain tops. Grosnygrad, the ultimate fortress. This massive compound surrounded by towering walls and armed guards and patrolling every inch of the perimeter. Complete with tanks, spotlights and enough firepower to take down a small army. But here's the thing, Grosnygrad isn't just any old fortress. It's the ultimate stronghold, home to a top secret armories, tanks and all sorts of high-tech gadgets. And at the heart of it all lies the development of the very Shagohod. Now, as the sight of all those guns and tanks was intimidating enough, there's also this subtle sound in the background, sirens echoing in the distance like a warning of impending danger. And if it's not enough to send shivers down your spine, it's a constant reminder that you're walking into the lion's den. But it truly is a refreshing change of environment other than just being outdoors, with inside Grosnygrad offers so much to play with. Somebody forgot to flush. Even on the outskirts of Grosnygrad, there's such things as the torture facility and the prisons, where there's some very nice posters to look at, just like Metal Gear Solid 2. <laughs> By the time you've managed to get inside Grosnygrad and stuff Rykov's body within the locker, you've managed to snag Rykov's uniform and suddenly you're strutting around Grosnygrad like you own the place. Instead of just blending in and doing your mission like a good little spy, you can't help yourself but be mischievous and let the side of your dark humour take over. Maybe you're sneaking up behind scientists, knocking them out unconsciously, and then saluting at them afterwards, giving them the ultimate confusion. The hilarity is we're meant to remain anonymous as possible, but we can't help ourselves break the rules and just potentially give away our position, which doesn't seem to matter because it seems to be working just fine. It appears being on your own guards is perfectly acceptable. The level design structure of this particular segment is genius because it's really a break from all the infiltration on the outside. Now we're on the inside within Grosnygrad to be able to take full advantage of the disguise. How can we forget? Time. Where'd he go? Oh, oh my stomach. Oh, oh, I can't hold it anymore. The level of nostalgia is definitely a real thing when we're locked up inside the prison cell, face to face with the one and only Johnny, the lovable guard with a bit of a digestive issue, if you catch my drift. Now here's the thing, instead of just sitting around twiddling our thumbs, we decide to have a little fun with poor Johnny. We slip under the bed like a stealthy ninja and start pulling pranks left and right, just to see the look on his face. He's like a game of cat and mouse, except where the cat and Johnny's the unwitting mouse. But then something unexpected happens, Johnny starts to open up to us. Maybe it's the camaraderie of being stuck in the same boat, or maybe he's just lonely. You must be pretty lonely. Yeah, I am pretty lonely. Really lonely. Either way, we seize the opportunity to earn his trust by offering his own rotten food back to him. Because nothing brings people together like a good meal, right? And that's when things get really interesting when we have a brief conversation with Johnny and suddenly the game rewards us with a codec code by looking at his photograph with the very escape codec upside down. It's the ultimate way to bust our ass out of jail. But the kicker is... We're not just limited to breaking out of jail in the conventional way. Oh no, we also have the option to hilariously play dead, fooling Johnny into opening the cell door and letting us escape. It's like something straight out of a slapstick comedy and it's guaranteed to leave you in stitches. It 
It gets so ever so memorable when we have to escape the sewers with no equipment and practically we're missing an eye. We can literally smell the disgusting stench of this sewer. You can literally feel the level of humidity and muskiness and the cold water touching your skin. You can practically even taste the sweet corn that's in the shit that is floating in the river. Just kidding. In Snake Eater, the inclusion of animals adds a pivotal layer of the interactivity to the map, engaging players in a dynamic survival experience unlike any other. From the moment you step into the wilds of Salino, you ask, you're not just navigating through a game world, you're immersing yourself in a living, breathing ecosystem in order to survive. Not every animal is edible and will cause you to get poisoned, which also makes interactivity with the cure menu all the more engaging. You can even actually use animals in a particular way that can benefit you to get past the enemies. Perhaps they might be feeling a bit peckish and eat the wrong animal. In the end, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater stands as a shining example of impeccable pacing and masterful map design seamlessly bending gameplay mechanics and environmental immersion to create an unforgettable experience. The pacing really is like a perfectly choreographed dance, with moments of quiet introspection balanced seamlessly with heart-pounding action sequences. Whether you're exploring a tranquil forest or infiltrating a heavily guarded fortress, the pacing keeps you on edge of your seat, eager to see what lies around the next corner. So in the end, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater is more than just a game, it's a masterpiece of interactive storytelling, a testament to the power of immersive gameplay and thoughtful map design. It's the journey through the world that feels alive and dynamic, where every decision you make has consequences, and every moment is filled with possibility, and it's an experience that will stay with you long after the credits roll. It's a testament to the enduring brilliance of Hideo Kojima's vision. Until we meet again, John. This has been your host, The Voice Box. I hope you've enjoyed this video, guys. Episode 2 will be coming soon, which will be the conclusion of this very topic. The final episode will be touching up on some important topics such as Metal Gear Solid 5 regarding the very important subject matter of this video. Hope you've enjoyed this video, guys. And if you can, hit that like button and subscribe and turn the notification bells on for more Metal Gear Solid content.